Welcome once again as we come to the conclusion of our study of the book of Isaiah. I certainly appreciate you uh, continuing in this study. Those of you that began it from uh, the beginning of uh, the book of Isaiah, perhaps some that go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis in January the 1st, 2023. It's been somewhat of a long journey at times, especially when you're considering prophecy and the interpretation of prophecy. But I want to encourage those of you that perhaps are reading and studying the Bible verse by verse for the first time to persevere. What you're doing is laying a foundation that you'll be building your spiritual faith on throughout the rest of your life as you're faithful. Now, of course, as we uh, soon will enter into the book of the, the New Testament Gospels, uh, we're laying the foundation that you're certainly going to appreciate being able to stand on the truths of the Old Testament, and particularly the prophecies, which are gonna give us insight into the first coming of Christ, born of a virgin, Mary, and then the second coming of Christ, which we will see in our study today. And so we uh, are today arriving at Isaiah 65 and 66. Those are the last two chapters of the book of Isaiah. And I've titled this devotional, The End is Only the Beginning, Isaiah 65 and 66. Well, consider with me in verse 1 of Isaiah 65 what I would subtopic as salvation offered to the Gentiles. Now, Isaiah 65 opened with the Lord saying, and I'm going to quote, I am salt of them that is not for me. I am found of them that salt me not. I said, behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. Well, we know for a fact that Israel was bearing the name of the Lord and was called by his name and was called by him. And so who is this nation that is not called by the Lord's name? It is that of the Gentiles, most of you being from Gentile roots. Well, the Lord's heart was evident toward an unholy people in this verse whom I do believe were Gentiles. Now, out of his love and compassion for sinners, the Lord allowed himself to be called by those who did not ask and found by those who had not sought. Indeed, those his own were estranged, though his own were estranged, speaking of the Jews, because of their sins, the Lord still sought his people, people through the prophet's words. And then notice verses two through five. Here we have Israel rejected by the Lord and he would use Babylon to punish his people. Now, though the Lord opened his hands to Israel in verse two, the people refused his invitation, rebelled, and we read that they walked, quote, in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. They, verse three, turned to idols. In fact, we read that they practiced the occult and consulted with dead spirits among the graves in verse 4. In verse 5, they also disobeyed the law, and we read that they ate swine's flesh. They were proud and self-righteous, and they said, quote, Come not near to me, for I am holier than thou was a nation. They had become, in the words of the Lord, a stench, a smoke in the Lord's nose. Then consider God's warning to the rebellious. Well, Isaiah revealed that the Lord records our sins in verse 6, and he warned that he will judge our sins and not keep silence, but will recompense, meaning will repay. As one evangelist said, there's a payday someday for our sins. Indeed, as you come to verse 7, the sins of every generation will be punished. And yet in verse 8, the Lord is loving and forgiving and promised he would not destroy them all. And then we have this wonderful picture of a grape gatherer who puts grapes in a, in a large vat and by stomping on them with his feet is able to crush the grapes 
from which uh, juice will flow. Now, the illustration is that, and so let's look at verses 8 and 9. Now, understanding a grape gatherer does not destroy all the grapes due to a few sour grapes. The Lord will not condemn all men, but will save a remnant. And we read in verses 10 through 16, actually, for some would seek the Lord. And then we have, beginning in verse 17 and really continuing all the way through chapter 66, a prophetic portrait of Christ's millennial kingdom. And so Isaiah 65 concluded in verse 17 with God affirming that he would make all things new. Now we know the effects of sin impact our earth and the curse of sin and the depravity of man has infected and affected all creation. And nevertheless, Isaiah prophesied there was coming a day when, and I quote, the former shall not be remembered nor come into the mind for the Lord promised, verse 17, behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Well, in that day, Believers will rejoice in verse 19, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. In fact, in verse 20, the citizens of the millennial kingdom will not know death in the same way you and I understand death today. And then we come to verses 21 through 23, and here we have the people of the millennial kingdom. And they will be engaged in meaningful work, and their labor, we read, will be blessed. In fact, believers will enjoy fellowship with the Lord himself, and they will, verse 24, want for nothing. And then we have this wonderful picture. And I can think of nothing more picturesque of the peace of God than when all nature will dwell together in peace. You're probably familiar with verse 25. And in the millennial kingdom, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat, and they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. Well, briefly, Isaiah 66. We begin with verses 1 and 2, what I would say is the incomparable glory of the Lord. And so our study of the prophet Isaiah concludes with chapter 66. Now this final chapter begins then with a striking truth, and that is found in verse 1, that the Lord declared, the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. And then the question, where is the house that ye, speaking to men, that ye build unto me? Where is the place of my rest? In essence, the Lord challenged Israel that no temple constructed by men could contain the majesty of his person. In fact, he dwells in heaven, and he created heaven and the earth, and the earth is but a footstool in his sight. And so of the truth, Israel was guilty of forgetting the sanctity and the holiness of the Lord, and yet the Lord reminded them that he was the creator of heaven and earth, and he looks for those who are, verse 2, of a poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at his word. He seeks the heart that is poor, the heart that is contrite, or the spirit that is contrite, and the one who trembleth. To tremble before the Lord is to fear and to revere him. And then we're reminded that the Lord despises hypocrisy in verses 3 and 4. And so we find that the sacrifices of the wicked are unacceptable to the Lord, and he despises those who worship him with anything less than a humble, broken, and reverential heart. And then verse 5 and 6 remind us that the Lord is judge. Now, believers who sincerely quote, tremble, revere, and obey the word of the Lord would be hated by some they call brethren. Now, Isaiah foretold how some who faithfully identified with the Lord's name would be cast out. And yet in verse 5, the Lord will be glorified and the wicked would be put to shame. And so the prophet prophesied that the Lord would punish his enemies. Well, we're brought back in verses 7 through 14 to the city of Jerusalem. And what I would suggest would be her travail and her homecoming. 
Now, there are various opinions on the interpretation of Isaiah 66 and 7 through 14. However, I think the most fitting is that Jerusalem is the woman in labor in verse in the verses, especially note verse 10. Now, though today Jerusalem is torn and divided by war, Isaiah prophesied that a day would come when Jerusalem would be a city of rejoicing, worship, and comfort. Well, on that day, Jerusalem will be at peace and Gentile nations will come to the city where Christ reigns and will be nourished and comforted. Verses 12 through 13. There will be justice when the hearts of God's people rejoice and his enemies are punished. And then note with me the second coming of Christ that we find uh, foretold in verses 15 through 21. Now the coming of the Lord will be terrifying to lost sinners and a triumphant expectation for believers. And so the Lord foretold, quote, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. In fact, in verse 16, the wicked will perish, quote, by fire and by his sword, will the Lord plead, literally pass judgment with all flesh. Of course, this is speaking of the lost, the wicked. In fact, in verse 16, we, we read, many will be slain by the Lord, and the wicked who thought to purify themselves by idolatry shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. Then we note eternity. In verse 22, declaring the new heavens and the new earth, the children of God are promised they will continue as people forever. The worship of the Lord will be continual from month to month and week to week. And on that day, verse 23, all flesh will come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Well, a closing thought for this study in the book of Isaiah now, while there are some that believe that hell and the lake of fire are limited to the New Testament, particularly in Luke chapter 16, the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes being in torment, or Revelation 20 where we have the great white throne. In Isaiah 66 and verse 24, however, there is recorded a perpetual place of fire and torment for those who transgress God's commandments and rejected his offer of salvation. In fact, we read as we close Isaiah 66 and verse 24. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, against the Lord. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. And they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. My friend, remember, the end is only the beginning. And you and I should weigh where we will spend eternity. If you do not know the Lord, won't you right now realize there is a payday someday. And it's far better to stand before God in eternity, having recognized and accepted Jesus Christ is your Redeemer. That is, He's paid the price of your sin. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is dead, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If he's not your Savior, right now, you can simply bow your head and pray, Oh God, I confess that I'm a sinner. I do believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I pray that you would make that decision today. God bless you, and bye-bye.